So I grew up around the Great Lakes, which means that I've seen sailboats my entire life. But until recently, I had never given much thought to how they worked. I think I just assumed that you put the wind at your back and off you went. And if you wanted to go against the wind or upwind, uh, maybe you, you zigzagged somehow or rotated the sails. I really hadn't given much thought to it. But the Great Lakes are a big part of my life, and sailboats are a big part of the Great Lakes. So I figured I would try and learn a thing or two. And that is how I ended up on a three-masted schooner. Turns out everything you see happening above the water here is only half the story. First off, intro time, this is my husband. I'm not gonna tell you much about him, and I politely ask that you respect his privacy. The main thing you need to know is that he's been sailing his whole life and is very familiar with the physics that makes sailboats go. So he helped me out with this project. And intro number two, this is the Alliance. It's a schooner owned by the Inland Seas Education Association near Traverse City, Michigan. In order to be a schooner, you have to have at least two masts and the one in the front cannot be taller than those behind it. And so I think we fit that criteria today, don't you guys think? This makes a schooner different from what I'll call a regular sailboat that only has one mast. Those are called sloops. And this is Carrie. She's the ship's mate and makes sure everything the captain says gets done. She's also just a deeply cool person, which is also true of everyone I met at Inland Seas. I got connected with this group a while back and I think they're a really wonderful organization. They run programs where you can come aboard the ship and learn about the science of the Great Lakes and how to steward them well and what a ship like this is like. And schooners are pretty sweet, honestly. Especially before larger steam-powered ships became popular, schooners were like the semi-trucks of the Great Lakes and beyond. They hauled all kinds of cargo from one port to another and facilitated all the economic opportunities that came with that. So I was excited to experience this little piece of my home's history. But the first thing I learned when I came aboard is that sailing, as it turns out, involves a lot of vocabulary. So I think that one's the throat halyard. Or mizzen, main, four. And that's called a gaff. Staysail. Our foresail here. And then the jib. So here's what you need to know for this video. First off, sloops. They're usually flying some combination of three sails. There's the main sail. There's a sail in front of that called a jib or a genoa if it's big enough or depending on the situation, the crew might swap its jib for a spinnaker, which looks the most like a parachute. As a traditionally rigged three-masted schooner, Alliance does things a bit differently, but I will note the same basic physics principles all apply. The Alliance is about 105 feet long and it has three big sails and two small ones. The big sails are the mizzen, the main, and the foresail, or the foresail, if you're feeling authentic and they each have their own mast. These three are called gaff-rigged sails because they have a beam of wood on top. Then you have the two smaller sails, which the crew calls the staysail and the jib. And all that technical like distinction didn't come about really until the industrial age. Names for ships prior to that wasn't as steadfast. I mean, there were ships that they would call sloops that we wouldn't call a sloop, we'd call it a brig or something. But I think it was really during the industrial age which was the era of coming up with technical terms and being more precise about stuff is where they started really coming up with these little details and semantics about different sailing rigs. That's Captain Ben, by the way. He's been on staff with Inland Seas for more than 10 years and makes steering a 105-foot schooner look easier than driving a golf cart. This is an insane level of maneuvering. He's just doing this. Also, regardless of what you call them, those sails, they're no joke to raise. I got to help raise the largest sail, the mizzen, and by the time we were done, my dominant arm was feeling it. And that's because there's no super fancy equipment to help get those heavy sails up on the Alliance. There's just human muscle power and good old fashioned pulleys. Ho! 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 That's well, all the way together. All the way. I'm going to fall backwards, you pull me up. Ready, go. Well, ready. Ready. <laughs> but once those sails were up, 
it was pretty magical. I'm someone who's used to traveling in a noisy car or maybe by bus or train or airplane. So traveling just under wind power, well, I'll let you listen for yourself. Power boats could never. In any case, my big question I wanted to answer was how this works. Again, going downwind seems pretty straightforward. You just put the wind approximately at your back. Although I should note that even that is not always perfectly straightforward and you might choose a different course depending on the situation, but we're keeping things 101 here. What happens if you wanna go against the wind though? Well, here's where I think things start to get really interesting. In the broadest strokes possible, can you go directly against the wind? And in any case, regardless of what that answer is, like, how do you go in that general direction at all? The first question, no. No, you okay. can't sail straight into the wind. If you try, there's a there's an exclusion zone near the wind. It can be you know, about 30 to 45 degree half angle, depends on the boat. If you're in that that angle, then your sail's uh, luff which is where they just kind of collapse and they'll, they'll sit there and flap and you won't really go anywhere. So if you want to get upwind, you do it by zigzagging. You kind of get as close as you can and go that way for a while and then you turn and go the other way and you just zigzag uh, in on it like that. This zigzagging is either called tacking or jiving, depending on how you do it. On the Alliance, I mostly saw the former. Explain to me tacking. Basically changing direction by turning into the wind. So opposed to that is jibing, where you're getting, you're turning from the stern versus from the bow. So at some point during attack, the bow of your boat is pointed directly into the wind. At some point during a jibe, you are pointed directly downwind. The stern of your boat is directly facing the wind. Okay, okay. Do you only tack going upwind and only jibe going downwind with a big asterisk? I'm sure. assuming there are always exceptions. Right, tacking is much more common going upwind. Jibing is much more common going downwind. Okay. There could be reasons you would do either. Yeah, and you'll you'll hear different commands too. So when we're tacking, the captain will say, ready about. Ready about. Ready about. We're coming about, we're coming into the wind. Okay. And then when he turns the wheel, he'll say, helms a lee. Helms a lee. Helms a lee. So we're turning and you'll see the gaff rig sails pass over. And from there, you'll watch, we're gonna back the head soles, which basically means don't let them swing over with the rest of the sails. We're gonna hold them and so the wind has them tight to push the bow over. So that's a back wind jib. That's just implying, imparting a huge torque on the boat. And then once we know we're out of irons or we've passed through the wind, then the captain will say, pass the jib. And from there, we'll pass the headsails onto the other side. Pass your jib. Pass the jib. On this boat, you notice they don't cross the jib until Captain Ben says cross the jib. Till then, they're holding the jib on the wrong side of the boat and it'll be filled the wrong direction. That's a huge sideways force on the boat at that point. And because that sideways force is so far up there, it's a it's a huge torque and it pushes the front of the boat around. Okay. Otherwise on a long boat like this, it might take you a while to get through head to wind and you'll lose a lot of speed. So tacking and jibing are a huge part of sailing, as is trimming or adjusting the sails to make the best use of the wind possible. And as for what best means, it depends. So I see you're managing this, uh, this sail yes. on the tack. I guess, what are you doing in the tack? Yeah, so essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking up slack as we turn into the wind and then it just passes on over. And then what I'm doing is I watch as we turn and find our new course. First, we're gonna trim our jib, then the staysail. And from that, I'll trim our foresail here. So why do you trim starting from the, the foresails in the, the back? Yeah, so we start forward because uh, so say we brought our jib in too much, it might start heading our staysail. So basically it's blocking the wind from it. So in, instead of allowing that staysail to fill up with wind, it's getting closed off from the wind from the jib. Okay, so basically each sail can affect the wind of the sail behind it, so you have to... Exactly, okay. exactly. Now, I got to see a lot of the ship, but there's one part of the Alliance I didn't get to see for obvious reasons. And it's one that has a much bigger role in going upwind than I thought, the keel. Part of the keel's job is to keep a sailboat upright in the water. It's a counterweight that offsets the weight of the masts and the sails and all that good stuff. But it also has another job. So the way you go upwind in general, really short version is the keel provides the force. I think this will make 
basically no sense without a diagram. Can I draw something? Yes, please. Okay. Also, this might just say something about me, but I had been sailing for like 18 years, 16 to 18 years by the time I figured out how this actually works. And that was because I took a naval architecture class. Okay. So here's a boat and we're looking only above the water right now. So above the water, this boat has a sail. You also might notice the sail has to be able to curve in both directions. The sail creates that curvature uh, itself. It's, it's built to, to be that shape, but it's flexible so it can make that shape on either side. Oh, interesting. To me, a sail is the equivalent of like a carefully cut bed sheet and a bed sheet, <laughs> a bed sheet is not designed to curve out any certain way. It just does when the wind blows on it. So how wrong am I? So interestingly, actually, if you, if you have really old sails, you will start referring to them as bed sheets. So tell me about a good sail. So it's generally a, a really high quality fabric, relatively stiff, very strong, and also ideally low drag. But then there are also, there are a lot of uh, veins and, and threads going through them in, in certain directions that will uh, encourage it to when it's, you know, when, when there's a, a wind blowing on it, it will take a certain shape. Yeah, so this sail has some curvature to it and it is an intentional curve. Um, in much the same way that an airplane wing works better if it has some curvature to it. Same thing with a sail. We want it to be curved so that it's better at scooping the wind and then redirecting it in a different direction. Okay. So the wind uh, approaches the uh, approaches the sail, you know, passes over the sail. When you redirect the wind, that creates lift. And really, th there's also drag. There's yeah. always drag. Mm -hmm. We live in a viscous world. <laughs> so. It also seems like a philosophical observation. <laughs> Bring it back. So you have what we're calling two forces, lift and drag. You can see this is kind of pointed the wrong direction, right? This isn't sending us the way we want to go. That yeah. is distinctly not upwind. Right. Yep. So now let's look at under the water. See that you're not going quite straight through the water. You're pointed a little bit more upwind than your direction of travel. The reason for that will become clear here. Cool. The thing doing all the work down here is the keel. I'm using keel generally. It could be a fixed keel, could be a centerboard. Keels also come in different shapes than what I'm drawing right here. Okay. So with the water coming in at this slight angle, now you can see this is another airfoil here. So it's going to do the same thing. It's going to turn that water a little bit and we're going to get two resultant forces, drag and lift, again perpendicular to the direction that the water is coming in. So now we have our two forces, which we've described as four components, lift and drag from the air, lift and drag from the water. So if we add all of these up on the same boat, you can see that our two drags are not doing us a whole lot of good, but our two lift forces, we can move forward and upwind. And I do recognize that really what I've answered here is not how do you go upwind, but how do you keep going upwind once you are going upwind? But all of these same principles apply to getting the boat going. It's just that then your, your forces are changing a lot and you generally will start by side slipping a little bit more. And then once you pick up speed, you can point into the wind a little bit better. Okay. So in summary, the sail catches the force of the wind and allows you to move through the water. And once you're moving through the water, the keel redirects those forces and allows you to actually go upwind instead of just slipping sideways. Overall, this is just so much more involved than I thought it was. And if you want to hear more of our conversation, I'm getting ready to upload an extended version. You'll be able to find a link in the description and at the top of the screen here. Ultimately, if I learned anything during this whole adventure, it's that I have just scratched the surface when it comes to sailing and sailboat design. There is just so much skill involved in reading the wind and reading the sails and adjusting everything on the fly as those conditions change. And that's not even getting into the design half of the equation, creating hulls and keels that are the perfect shape to maximize lift while minimizing drag. I feel like I've mostly learned how little I know, but one thing's for sure, I now have a much deeper appreciation for and understanding of the sailboats I see kicking around the Great Lakes. And also, I think I have to learn how to sail. This video is brought to you by you. Whether you've supported the series on Patreon or buy me a coffee or just watched a few episodes, your support and attention made all this travel and production stuff possible, so thank you. And if you're new to this series and enjoy watching stuff like this, please consider subscribing. I know people tell you to do that all the time on YouTube, but it helps me understand how my work is resonating with people. For now though, thanks for being here. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you soon.